Okay, well, we're off and running. Um, so welcome to GW Coders. Um, here we are again. And today I'm happy to introduce Joshua, who's then uh, talk with us about some of the uh, VR, AR related technologies and trainings and stuff that we have available as a way to get us introduced. Um, then we'll have a short period for any other announcements. And then after that, I'm going to go over some coding that I've been doing with using um, Google app scripts to link together between Google calendars, Google sheets, and Google forms. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to you, Joshua, to talk some about the programming and things that you're doing. Yeah. Thanks for having me. My name is Joshua Gleason. Uh, I'm an instructional technologist of digi digital multimedia with the uh, newly formed uh, create Digital Studio that operates out of LAI. Um, it is both a physical space, which is on the first floor of Gelman Library, uh, which hopefully will have some patrons in it at some point. But it also is something that between me and my colleague, Ben Horn, who's also another instructional technologist, uh, we together are able to offer a whole sort of uh, programming, a sort of programming, so workshops on things like Photoshop, Premiere, uh, Adobe XD, which is an application prototyping tool, run anything really in the Adobe Creative Cloud suite, which everyone on uh, campus has access to, everyone who has a GW uh, account, so faculty, students, and staff, uh, any of the programs that are in there, as well as, uh, in addition, Unity, we support that, so we do workshops on that. We can do individual consultations on anything in between there, and that can be for single people. We can do group consultations for projects, uh, consultations with faculty, anything, uh, you know, that you can conjure up. And we also dabble in a couple other things uh, that we hopefully will be able to expand next semester. So we have some stuff that we want to do on 3D printing, uh, just walking through the steps of how to do that. We have two 3D printers that we've set up, uh, VR. We have a VR setup that we're putting together so we can walk through on how to use VR with things like Unreal and Unity, like I had, uh, had mentioned, which are both game design tools, which are predominantly used to develop VR applications, AR applications, um, and really just anything in that space. Uh, and our, one of our main focuses, that's an initiative uh, for LAI in general, is uh, increasing the amount of computational uh, and digital fluency and literacy. So for, what us, uh, for us, what that means is basically creating a foundation where people start to understand and have access to and the ability to learn and be supported through uh, you know, kind of learning these like digital storytelling skill sets, uh, you know, knowledge base applications, whatever that might look like. So whether it's creating videos, podcasts, uh, you know, interactive applications, websites, uh, you know, there's, if you're talking about like the basic design digital storytelling component, um, we can help with that part, right? So talking about walking through, you know, hey, I want to create this, you know, page, like there's an application for Adobe called Adobe Spark which you can use to do all kinds of things. But one of them is you can create like a very simple interactive web page with no coding knowledge. Um, and it's kind of similar to like it's a website template, very similar to um, like, so what, is it, what would be a good one? Uh, Squarespace is a great example where you kind of put together pieces. Um, so we've been doing a lot of stuff like that for helping people, you know, communicate their research or other things that they're doing, their projects assignments uh, in a different way, right? And something a little bit more unique and modern. Um, and yeah, we can really just, we run the gamut through all that stuff. Uh, and I, unfortunately, my colleague uh, Ben Horn is having some technical difficulties getting into the meeting, but he might be able to jump in so you can meet him at some point. But uh, he's here. awesome too. Are you here, Ben? I'm here. Awesome. Okay, cool. I didn't see you pop up. Yeah. Do you want to just say hello real quick? Hi, everybody. My name is Ben Horn and I'm an instructional technologist with the Create Digital Studio as well. Uh, I, I, I heard the second half of Joshua's uh, uh, introduction sound like he did a great job. I think uh, he did a great job explaining what it is we're working on and what we're doing. So uh, I am here. Thank nice to meet you all. And uh, nice to see uh, a lot of familiar faces as well. Yeah, so that, that pretty much sums it up. So if you have any questions, um, we'd love them. Otherwise, you can reach us. I'll put it in the chat. But uh, the we have a landing page, uh, which is library.gw.edu slash create, uh, where you can make consultations with us, uh, email us. Uh, see our work, uh, workshop schedule. Uh, so that, there'll be a link to the workshop schedule on that page. And 
yeah, any other information that we have. We have a uh, AV studio. So eventually when people are able to come back on campus, they can record things in the studio, uh, whether it's sound or video, all that jazz, it's all located on that page. Uh, and, and also I forgot to mention as well, uh, equi- uh, check, check out equipment. So being able to check out uh, cameras and things like that, microphones for anyone who's approved to be on campus and obviously in the future, just anyone in general. Um, so yeah, if anybody has questions, feel free to let me know. Thanks. Great. Um, and I guess since we're a coding group at heart, um, do you want to just give a quick rundown on what languages you have experience with in case people are entering into a language and might have questions about it? Yeah. So I primarily use C Sharp. Uh, that's the, the primary scripting tool for Unity. Um, and I also use JavaScript. Uh, I have uh, used other languages in the past, uh, but primarily for things like uh, Arduino's proprietary language, which is derived from, I think, C++. And uh, I've had a lot of experience doing things with like HTML and stuff like that, but I primarily focus on those other languages because uh, those are the ones that I keep current on just with my background in Unity. Uh, in Apple, like I, so I worked uh, before coming to GW uh, at a private institution doing app development for uh, creating uh, applications for the Microsoft HoloLens. So AR, and that was primarily done through Unity using C Sharp. Um, and so those, those, that, those two languages, C Sharp and, and JavaScript are my primary coding languages. Okay, great. And Ben? Um, I, most of my coding is either fairly rudimentary or very, very rusty. I worked on, um, uh, I worked with uh, ActionScript back in my undergraduate years, uh, and I have uh, worked a little bit with Python, but I'm uh, a, a lot more, uh, a lot more uh, on a uh, rudimentary level, personally, in terms of coding. Yeah, no worries. I think many of us fall into that category, too. Yeah. Um, or we're self-taught and we just do what we can. Exactly, um, exactly. That's good. That's why GW Coders is here to bring these communities together. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we do have an announcement too that for anyone who's interested um, in getting together in person, um, there is going to be a happy hour tonight at 5 p.m. at Circa being organized by one of our students, Liz. Um, and so if anyone is interested, um, if you could just connect with her either through the chat room here or um, there's some Slack messages about it as well. So again, that's 5 p.m. tonight at Circa there on campus if anyone is um, up for meeting up, um, hopefully in a safe way wearing masks other than when you're drinking. Are there any other announcements, any workshops or anything that we should get announced from the libraries coming up? Uh, I guess just uh, um, thanks for sharing earlier, the Data Carpentry Workshop, Data Carpentry Week signups. Um, I think, I don't know that it's 100% closed, so might not be too late to sign up uh, if you want to do a few workshops next week on um, Git and Bash and Shell and then either Python or R. And uh, I do want to mention too, we have uh, two workshops coming up that would be great for people who are interested in uh, some of the things I talked about. So we have a Unity VR workshop coming up. Uh, that's two weeks from now. And we have a Adobe XD workshop, which actually they just announced a new integration with an extension out of Visual Studio uh, so that you can, uh, Adobe XD is used to create application prototypes, so the front end of an application. Um, but with this new integration, uh, it's a lot easier to create the back end of the application as well. So this uh, workshop is kind of just a generic introduction to that program, but that's uh, next week. And that'll be on the link I posted as well with the other uh, library workshops. Just from my own, uh, personal things. So I might be doing a project or being part of a project related to Oculus development for VR, like 360 video for education purpose. Um, what does Oculus run in? Does it run in the same languages or how does that work? 
Yeah, so it's uh, you can. There's a lot of different ways that you can create VR applications. Um, the two most popular, I would say, just for ease of accessibility, is uh, Unreal and Unity because they're game design okay. engines that are made to operate uh, with, uh, you know, 3D space and all that jazz. Uh, and they have a lot of uh, kits, toolkits that are kind of been developed open source to work with those different headsets, which are really, you know, instead of having to code a bunch of stuff on your own to make sure that it works the way you want it to work. A lot of people have done that work for you, which is great. Um, but with 360 video, it's a little bit different. There's actually a lot of applications, uh, you know, paid for free applications, even um, some of the applications that are part of the Adobe Creative Cloud that you can actually, depending on how interactive you want your 360 video to be, um, there's a lot of uh, applications that you need little to no coding uh, to create an interactive 360 video, um, but it depends on how interactive you want it to be. So if you're talking about kind of progressing through something simplistic, um, it's usually pretty accessible with limited uh, coding experience needed. Uh, but like okay. I said, if you want to start creating a more interactive uh, uh, application where you kind of are going through different videos and having menus and stuff like that, that can get a little bit more involved. Okay. Yeah, I'll get with you if the project comes together. We're just applying yeah, for, for funding sure. for it. So. Okay, if there are no other announcements, um, then I'll go ahead and give my presentation. I'll say one more thing while you're getting set up. Um, just a plug for a completely unrelated talk I'm about to give at noon, just in case you're interested. <laughs> I told Ryan that I, I'm going to have to leave early to get ready for this, but I just posted it in the chat. I'm giving a talk on US-China relations and low carbon energy, not at all related to coding. But in case you're interested, there you go. <laughs> it could be exciting still though, anyway. Okay. So hopefully everyone sees the calendar now. Um, so what I wanna talk about is linking between different Google apps. Um, and so this first example I'm gonna give is actually what we've done for the GW Coders calendar, um, which has, of course, events coming up for the future weeks. And we wanted to be able to update those events and then have those updates get pushed to the calendar instead of having to go in each week and click on the event and click edit and then edit it. And then if you move it, then you have to switch it around. Um, and I've done some work with this before and that will be my second example if there's time where I link together between a spreadsheet and a Google form so that I could automatically update questions in a Google survey um, based on scraping some websites. So I'll try to get to that too, but it's an introduction to some of the tools that Google has for customizing um, the work that you might be doing. Um, so again, this is a calendar. This is the starting place. You have to create a calendar that you want to populate. Um, so I went into the calendars and I added a new calendar through one of these menus over here. And that's this GW Coders meetup calendar that I added. And you have to do this first because what you have to have out of the settings of the calendar at one point is there's a calendar ID number that gets assigned to each calendar that you create. And you'll have to have that in the code so it knows which calendar to update with the information that you're doing. So you first wanna create the calendar and so you have that code for later. And then you have to create a spreadsheet. So just a new blank spreadsheet that you want to have. Um, that's going to then be the one that gets information fed from it um, into the calendar. So in this one, I have the first tab, I call it schedule. And as you can see, it's our draft schedule as to upcoming presentations. Um, and there's still some areas to be filled in where I have the TBDs. But next week you'll see we're gonna have Twitter data and COVID. Um, and then we're gonna have some data mining discussions. We have web scraping coming up later as well. 
so this is the format that I wanted to be able to create the items in. Um, and then I wanted to be able to push that to the calendar. So what I did was I created a cell just so that I'd have the calendar address in the sheet itself. You wouldn't have to do this, but it just makes it easier, especially if you end up having multiple sheets and you might be linking to multiple calendars with different pieces of information. So I just referenced the ID of the calendar in the sheet itself. And then I created start times, end times, topics, descriptions, who's the presenter, um, and those are the five fields that I wanted to have go to the calendar. I have some other fields that I probably won't have go to the calendar for any reason. Um, so that's pretty easy to get started. You kind of have to create what is the structure that you want in the spreadsheet so that you can send it to the calendar. And then the, where it gets more interesting is when you come up to tools, you'll see that there's this tool called script editor. And if you click on it, and this is, um, it's in docs and it's in slides and it's in sheets. I don't remember if they have it. Maybe they do have it in forms as well, but you can create this from any of them. Um, I've usually just created them in sheets because I've been wanting to link my sheets to other things. Um, so that's why I found it there. But I think you could start this even from another place, though I don't think you can start it from the calendar. And what you'd, happens when you click on that um, is you get to what's called Google Apps Scripts. Um, so if you're gonna search up how to do things, that's what Google calls it. They call it Apps Scripts. Um, and it's just a simple tool and it is done in, um, it's basically Java and then it saves it as what they call GS files, which I guess is a Google scripts file. Um, so that's what I'm gonna walk us through today is how to do this, um, to link together this spreadsheet to your calendar. I've also put this on Git, of course, and it has the step-by-steps, I guess it's 11 steps of instructions to set this up. Um, and then the code and stuff is there, along with the link of the person's blog that I got the initial code from that I then customize, in case anyone's interested or wants to share it with others. And that's just off of my Git, and I'll post that in um, the Slack after we're done here. I'm not as good as John. I can't post to the chat room and give the presentation at the same time like he did last week. Um, so let's just walk through the lines of code. It's fairly straightforward um, once you know it. And I have this one fairly well marked up as my notes so that I remembered what to tell everyone else was important. Um, so the first thing you have to do is link your spreadsheet um, saying which spreadsheet you want to use for this script. Um, so for this function, which will update the calendar, I want to use the, cal um, the spreadsheet that we were just on. And you can just put in the whole URL for that. Um, you can also do it by ID. And the ID, if I did that, it would just be these numbers here. So you can link to any of your Google docs or sheets or um, calendars or anything else using a variety of methods. Um, you can link to them by their URL, by their ID. Uh, and specifically then, I wanted it to look at the sheet, the tab within that called schedule. Because if you remember back, I have two tabs, potential presenters and schedule. And I'm just telling it up front that I want to use the spreadsheet that's on this tab for schedule. And then I want to tell it to get the calendar um, down here on this line 14. And in order to do that, I just tell it to get the calendar ID from the spreadsheet. Um, so I could put in, instead of having 
calendar ID as my variable here, I could put in the calendar ID, or I can just link to it again because I put it here. So all I did was tell it to get it from cell A2 and then put it there. Um, so either way works. But now I have both my spreadsheet and my calendar as variables that I can use in the code. And that's to get things started. Within that sheet then, I tell it that I want to get a range of cells. So I want it to get from cell A5 over to E17. And if we come back to the spreadsheet, I have A5 and I wanna go all the way over here to E17. So these are the cells I'm telling it I want. If I create a new calendar or if I extend it going down, then I can just expand those cells. I can drop it down to, I could go down to whatever. Now, the only issue that I ran into or found out about was someone said that if you start getting hundreds and hundreds of cells, if you're not using them, it just slows down how long it takes to run your script. Um, so just select the cells that you're actually using and your script will run faster. Uh, but you can expand it, of course. So the first issue I ran into um, when I started playing with some code for this was that I ended up duplicating a lot of my events. So every time it ran, it would make a second, a third, a fourth, a fifth copy of it. And then I had to go back and delete all those. Um, so I created a short script to just delete everything first. So I have a from date to a to date. So I have everything from January 1st of this year to January 1st of 2022 in this calendar. I want to collect all those events here on line 24. So I told it to get the events between those two dates that I've established. And then I had to create a loop to go through and grab each one of those events because um, within the tools that they have, within the functions you have available to you, they have a delete event option, but they don't have a delete events function that you have to use. So I couldn't delete more than one event at one time. Um, and so I just loop through each of them and it takes each event and deletes it as it goes through. So every time it runs, it clears the calendar and then puts new items into the calendar, which may not be perfect. There might be a better way to do it. It's the easiest way I could figure out how not to get duplicate events. Um, but it's a good reminder too that I should actually, if you do, a, if you go to Google and you search for So all of this is documented um, in their documentation files and it tells you what you can do with each of theirs. So what you can do with scripts for docs, for slides, for forms. You can actually do it with your Google Drive. You can have scripts for your Gmail. Um, they all have different things you can do. So if you go into one of them, then it will tell you all of the different functions that you have available to you. Um, so you can do lots of things, as you can tell. Um, and then within that, for example, you can search for different, different functions that you might want to have. So again, I found where you could delete events, but you couldn't delete all events. So I just created a loop to go through that and delete each one of the events individually when they come through the loop. So all this, I think, is fairly straightforward at this point. Um, so, and it should be, most all of this up to now is, I, I don't work much, at, this is maybe the only work I actually do with Java. Um, so there's a few small differences. Mostly of what I've done is in Python and I do a little in R. Um, but basically you can figure it out. Um, so you have to name your variables, but their loops work pretty much like loops do elsewhere. Um, so you can 
just kind of play around until you get it figured out. Um, but it's pretty straightforward. So after we've deleted all of the events then, then the next thing to do was to populate the new events. And you can, again, just create a loop. And this time I want to loop through um, my spreadsheet instead of through the events that are in the calendar. Um, and when I do that then for each of the topics um, or for each of the rows basically, I want to get um, the beginning time, the end time, what the topic will be, what is the description and who is the presenter. So those five elements that I wanted to put into my calendar are, um, I pull each of those then as being cells within that row. So it's basically taking a row from um, my spreadsheet starting at A2. So it's the second row and it's pulling each of the cells. Um, and then what it's going to do is number the different pieces basically within it. So it's taking the first piece, the second piece. I guess technically what it's doing is creating um, a list for each row for the items and then I'm pulling the list items off. So like I'm pulling the first item off the list with this zero, the second item with the one, the two, the three, which is the same pretty much as you would do it in Python. So you can pull the items off of a list uh, by putting them in brackets like that. And it begins at zero, not at one. Always important to remember. Um, so now I've defined each time it loops through what variables it should get. Um, and then I'm going to place those into a create new calendar event. So I'm going to go to the calendar part of my script and I'm going to create an event. The topics that I have listed are just the topics like last week, um, John did our shiny apps. So I wanted to have it a little nicer. So I put in some text. So it'll add the text, which is in parentheses. Then it'll add the topic. And it's saying get topic, which was the third element from the row. And it's saying put it there. And then it will say with, and it will say the presenter. And then that's where it ends the first item, which is the title of the event. The second item is then the begin time. And the third item is the end time. Now that's all that's required in order to create an event. So I could end my parentheses here if I wanted like that, and that would create an event with a title, start time and end time. And those are three required elements. And how I knew that was as back here. And if I go into calendar, it will tell you in here, um, So if I do a create event, I have to have these three required elements. It won't create an event without a title, a start time, and an end time in that order. And then I saw that you can have these options that you can add to it, which includes the location and pieces like that. And I saw that if I want to add a description, I have to do that as a separate function. Um, so it's not an option, it's a description which falls in there. And of course I say, I discovered this, this is like, I had to look around a long time to figure out some of that. So then I could put in an option for the location, which is a field within your Google Calendar. And if I go back to the calendar, and I pull up an event, you'll see that this is the location. Uh, so there's the title. We can go back actually and look at John's. So remember I said I added GW coders column, then this is the topic variable, then I added the word with, and then the presenter variable. Then this is the location, it was an option. Um, 
And within options, I believe I read that you could also invite people. So if you wanted to have your invite list in your spreadsheet, you could actually put it in the spreadsheet and then it would populate into there as well. So you can do a, several different things within that options area. I wanted to add a reminder. So you'll see that I've added a reminder 30 minutes before and I set a description to fill in the description field. So that's it. That's the whole event. It has each of the elements I wanted. Um, and then I did at the end, I put in a sleep function because Google limits how many times you can create events within a second. So you can't create like 10,000 events um, and use up all of their server space and things. But if you put in a brief pause in between each event, then you won't run into their limitations they put on you. They also limit how many triggers you can run. Um, so I'll talk about that in just a second, but does anyone have questions? Yeah, it's pretty straightforward, I think. I've got a question about how it updates. So when you go, so is this thing just gonna continuously run? Like what's the trigger to make this run? Is it any time you edit the spreadsheet, it'll just run so on its own? Yep, um, so you can set it either way. You can set it on edit or you can set it on time. So what they have, instead of coding um, your triggers, they actually have under their edit menu, you can open triggers. Um, and these are basically cron jobs. Oh, what's that? Where did that? Oh, maybe I didn't click it. Oh, there it goes. So you can create um, triggers to go with any of the codes that you're writing. So let me. Oh, that's not what I want. Sorry. I'll just add a new trigger to show you how you get the options. So you pick the function that you want to run. So I have the function that says this, update the schedule. Um, I'll talk about this on open function in just a minute. Um, when you deploy it, it's just in the head. It never gives me any other options though. Maybe if I add other elements to my code, it will. Um, it can be time driven or it can be driven by from like within the spreadsheet. So you can set it like whenever the spreadsheet is edited, whenever there's a change, whenever a form is submitted. So if it's a form gets submitted to the spreadsheet, then you can run a function against that if you want that data to go somewhere else. Or you can choose time driven and you can do hourly, daily, monthly. You can add specific times that you want. Um, they do limit how much you can do. So you can't do like every three seconds. Um, but they do let you do every couple of minutes and they don't uh, send you any emails saying to stop it from what I can tell. And then you select the interval if you're going time driven or you can do it based on calendar. So they give you many different ways to run triggers. You can write your own triggers too, but they've always had enough options here that I haven't written any time triggers, but they do have a guide on how to write custom triggers. So as you can see, I have two um, functions basically, and we jumped down to the second one. Um, I also found this function and customized it a little to add it to a button on the spreadsheet. So you can actually add your own custom tools to your menu options on your Google Sheets or Docs or whatever tool you're using. Um, so this basically says when I open the sheet, it will um, add a menu item called sync to calendar. And there'll be one item under that called update calendar. 
And what it will do is run the function, function GW code schedule, this function right here. And then I add that to the user interface. So if I come back to the coders, you'll see that past the help, I now have this menu. And if I click on that, and if I click update, it will update all of the calendars. Um, so I can set it either to be manually updated like this, or you could set it to run once a day if that's what you were interested in. So all in all, I think it fairly easily, um, you can do a lot of powerful, interesting things with going back and be forth between your sheets, your calendars, your docs, your forms, and so forth. Um, things that might be useful. And this was useful for us because, again, it's easier to maintain all this information in a spreadsheet and then update it than it would be to continually go back into the calendar and update each calendar item and thanks for creating it. Yeah, not a problem. Um, we have a few minutes, so I'll show the other one I've done to this as well. So let me stop sharing this. Thanks, Brian. I'm going to have to step off now, but I'm glad I got to see that part because I'm almost certainly going to use this for something else, I'm sure. <laughs> so. Yeah, that's how I keep finding it. I'm like, oh, yeah. People use it to create quizzes like where it goes That's what it I was feeds thinking. to their Google form and then it, the results come back. And then once the results come back, you can send it somewhere else to have it computationally analyzed or whatever. I was you thinking about having a quiz. Loops. Yeah, that, that like a quiz that immediately takes the responses I get from a class and sends it to a Google slide or something. And then I can just open that up and show everyone yeah. in, in real time, like what what the class did or Got it oh, yeah, I hadn't thought about that. You could do that. It's almost like the clicker thing, but without having to subscribe. Without having to, to use all that. Those. Yeah, yeah. You can just use Google for free. Yeah. Anyway, customers. really cool. Okay. Thanks. So See I'll share the other one that I developed, which is this one. Okay, so this one's a little different. And it adds another very cool thing that I didn't know until this, <laughs> until COVID that you could do with Google Sheets because this was one of the things I was pl playing with at the beginning of having to be at home. Um, so again, it's going to use the Google scripts. And I have a couple of different scripts that will run on it. And just a little background. So my goal was I wanted to create a survey to ask people what parts of, like which types of articles are you interested in? Um, now I never ended up doing any of this, like research wise, just because after I created it, then I found other things to do. But basically the idea that I wanted to have, and here I'll bring up, is that you would choose what field or discipline you're interested in, you would click Econ, you would click Next, and you would get an up-to-date set of abstracts of articles, and I'd ask you, were you interested in reading the article or would you skip over that article? And I wanted it not to be static, so this is actually pulling articles from archive preprint services. So archive is a place where researchers in econ, physics, math, and other places post their articles prior to them being published. And they have an API, so you can pull data um, from archive to actually see um, what it is. So I'll show you real quick what actually this archive page looks like. That was econ. So let's see. So on archive, if you do a search and your search is just for asterisks, which is for anything. So these are all the newest things posted in October in the econ archive 
place. So these are articles that will probably be published, but they're on preprint service for initial sharing among scientists. And this is all run by Cornell. So I take these results and I pull them into a spreadsheet. Now, what I didn't know until I started playing around was um, Sheets does this pretty easily in that you can import XML, HTML, JSON files. The JSON is a little trickier. You have to add some code for that. But it's not hard. It's just you put something else on, and then you can pull in JSON files. Um, and it will import them. So this is just saying import the website that's in cell A1, which is that URL that we were just looking at. And I want to pull through that and anywhere where the class, like the CSS class, um, is title is five map Ajax, then I want to pull that data. And how I knew to do that was I was over here and I said, oh, this is what I want. So I did a right click and I inspected the element and it comes up as the class for titles. So how they know how to format a title is because it has this class. In any title I go to, um, we'll have that same class. The title will always have that same element to it. See, there again, it's classes, title, and then some other stuff that they use for their service. So anytime it sees that, then it's going to pull the data that follows from there. And then um, it just updates it. And so whenever something new would come in, it will update this file. And I'll get whatever are the newest abstracts posted on that website. So you can do web scraping pretty easily without having to go into um, any Python or R, which we would probably commonly use for web scraping. Uh, and it's slightly easier in that since it's now in a Google sheet, I can now send it to my Google form. So once again, I went to tools and I created a script. Let me try to get up to the script. There we go. Um, and this one's a little bit more complicated, but again, it's still not that complicated. Uh, so I, what we again did was at the beginning, I set what are the two that I want to work between. I want to have my spreadsheet and I want to link it to a Google form. That Google form, that number is just this number here in the URL, that ID number. So I'm just using the IDs for both of these. As before, I don't want to create duplicates. So I first wrote something that would delete any of the duplicates. Um, so again, it's looking for any items. It's looping through and it's deleting every place where there's an item. Pretty simple. So I always start clean every time it runs. On my form, I'm then going to have three basic item areas or sections. So if you remember right, I wanted to have a section where I asked you which discipline you were interested in. And then a section two, which has the econ questions. And then down here somewhere after 50, I have it set for 50. It asks the math questions. So the first one I create then is I create the what discipline. So I create, in the form, I add an item and it's called a list item. So again, you go into the document and it tells you like, what do they call a multiple choice item? What do they call a graph item? What do they call a select all that apply type item? Checklist items. They have a bunch of different item formats. But a list item is, um, like a pull down menu list. And we called that select discipline, as you'll see. If I go up here, there's select discipline. 
Um, now, one of the issues I had was it took me a while to figure out that I had to put in the other sections before I actually created the pull down menu uh, because I wanted to name these variables up here. I wanted to name econ and set up a new section or page break. So the next thing I did then was I created the econ section and I wanted it to be in a new section. So they use what they call add page break for that. And I called it econ. And when you get to the bottom of it, I want there to be a submit button. So I don't want you to have to do all of the disciplines. I just want you to do the discipline you selected and then submit. So I told it to add a submit button at the end of each. And I created another one of these for math, it's right down here below. But after I created it, then I put the items into it. So again, what I did was I told it what sheet I wanted. So I had to get the sheet by name. My sheet names are down here at the bottom. I have a math sheet, an econ sheet. So I tell it, get the econ sheet, take the cells A2 through D51. And I want you to get all the values. I want you to loop through those values. And again, each one is a row. And so I take the title from the row, the abstract from the row, and I get some other pieces. And then I set an item. I set the title of the item and I give it the two choices to either do you wanna read it or do you wanna skip it? And it creates the 50 items, one for each row, rows A2 through D51. And that's then what creates each of these items. So it has a title, has the abstract. The open piece is just something I was interested in, um, kind of a longer story. And then it has the two choices, do you read it or skip it? I do then the same for econ, it creates or for math, I mean, I creates the math section and then I get all the values from the spreadsheet. But this time I get it from the math tab instead of the econ tab. And then after that, I create my two choices for my pull down menu. And the reason, as I mentioned, that I have to create it after is that this second part, so the first part of the choice tells you the choice is math, so that's this pull down menu. And I want the first item to be math. But what I want to happen when you choose math is I want it to go to section three, which is called math. Um, so I want it to jump you someplace. So I wanted it to jump you to math. So I first had to create this variable math, which was the new section called math so that I could jump to it. So that's why I had to create those sections above where I created the choices because initially I had them below and when they were below down here at this bottom part, then I couldn't have a variable here because the variable was yet to be named. But after I named the variable, then I can include it in to tell it where to go. And that's it, that's the whole thing. Um, so that creates this pulls each of the abstracts out of the spreadsheet and adds it in, makes it items. And then it's a survey that you can take. And at the bottom, after you were to answer 50, you would hit submit and it would go into another spreadsheet that I would have where I could then use that. Um, the only other kind of interesting thing I did with this was I've found this code, I did not write this. It would have been a little above my skill level probably to figure some of this out. Um, but basically someone had figured 90% of this out for me. And what this code does is it again accesses my spreadsheet. But what it does is it um, updates the web scraping and then I said a trigger for this script to run once a day. So once a day, my web scraping 
will update and get the latest articles that are on archive. So they're not articles from June or July. Now they would be articles from October. Tomorrow, if people have uploaded new articles, this will look different and it will have the latest articles. Um, so you can update by rerunning this cell, this A2 cell. Every time you run that cell, it will update the script and go get it for you and bring down the newest information. So again, I don't have necessarily specific use for this, but I'm happy to now have the skills of being able to link all these Google Docs, Google Spreadsheets, Google Forms, Google Calendars together because sometimes you have wacky ideas of things you might want to do. Um, or like John, maybe you have useful ideas of things you could do, like create a form that gets updated with the data that people are providing and you can create these types of loops um, where everything just kind of cycles back around. Because whenever you create a form, if you haven't used forms before, it creates responses and responses has its own sheet. So you can always pull up and get the responses. They're time stamped. Um, they're also stamped with the um, email of the person who did it if they're doing it through Gmail. Um, I guess the only last thing, I haven't put this script onto Git yet, but if anyone wants it, um, I can put it on Git. But several of these things are on Git in other places too. So that's all I have. Um, any questions, any thoughts? Anyone see potential use for this of projects you're working on? You should be able to unmute yourself, by the way. Okay, well, we have a couple of minutes. Um, if you have friends or people you bump into that you think would benefit from joining our conversations, please let us know. As always, if you want to present on anything that you're doing, um, as you can see with our calendar, we have open spaces still for the fall for people to present on different topics. It could be something very basic. Um, it could be something more complex, depending on um, what you're doing. I think that this is how we share and we learn and we get creative ideas. If you're not on our Slack channel yet, then join our Slack, I guess, Join our Slack group so you can see our Slack channels. Um, but that's where we share during the week of opportunities, such as the meetup tonight at five for happy hour for anyone who's interested and is near campus. But we also have people sharing opportunities about upcoming workshops, activities, new resources, new software the university has available. Um, conferences, all kinds of stuff. So we have over 100 people on Slack who are all interested or have been doing trainings and stuff on coding. So it's a good community. Uh, I know that Liz has reached out and asked some questions about some Python that she's been writing. And fairly quickly, people have been getting back to her with suggestions about how to fix little issues she's having and things. Absolutely, like that. there's huge value <laughs> in that hotline. And that, that brings up a point that you mentioned earlier a few weeks ago, which is, you know, do you, do you split it into um, more entry level or higher level? It's been great to get some uh, different exposure to regex, um, today the Google scripts, uh, R, that's all fantastic. I think that probably where a lot of the students are is more at a basic level. So maybe, you know, interjecting a, a workshop on just core concepts. Um, 
of some of these every once in a while would be good. Um, I, I'm just speaking for myself in that I'm in a bridge class in graduate school. It's foundational and um, I'm, you know, it, remote learning is challenging. So uh, going over some of the, and it's, it's mostly Python and data structures, going over foundational concepts to make sure we really get them, that would be really helpful. Yeah, um, yeah, we can definitely find time to do that. And we have good resources. Um, so we have both, John has great resources for his classes on R online. It goes step by step through all the way into some fairly good data visualization. But we also have it um, for Python that Dr. Barba, Lorena Barba and um, mechanical engineering developed. But her intro modules, she has three intro modules that are all done as Jupyter notebooks. So you can write your code, test it out, see how it works and stuff. Well, we and those have, are all available we, online we for free. We have a really free. good online resource for practicing exercises, but what we don't hear have is something like you or John presenting um, yeah. concisely, clearly. <laughs> here, here are the core concepts and then being able to back and forth with it. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. I I, this is I'll that space video, too. Yeah, if you, if you'll put out a if you'll put out a session like that, I promise to come on video and not hide anymore. <laughs> not a problem. Um, right. Yeah, we can definitely. I we want this to be of use to students. We want students to be engaged and sharing what they're doing. Um, we definitely don't want this just to be faculty talking about how these things are done. Um, but it should be a student network where students can identify challenges that they're having and people who are working with the same languages and issues uh, that they're facing. Um, and we're here to help out however we can in facilitating Thank you. Yeah, that. Appreciate it. Great. Okay, well, thanks everyone for joining right. and we will see everyone next Friday. Right. Bye. Have a good fall break. <laughs>